Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the James D. Julia Auction House up in Maine, taking a look at some of the guns that they're going to be selling in their upcoming Fall of 2017 Firearms Auction. And today we're taking a look at a BAR. Not just any BAR, this is actually a Colt Monitor, which is one of the scarcest and in many ways one of the most interesting and sought after versions of the BAR. Now, as we probably know, the BAR was first developed uh, late in World War I by John Browning. Uh, it was just barely saw service with U.S. troops at the end of World War I. They were, there were some issues of production and getting all of the guns over to Europe and then getting them assigned out to units. There was some concern from General Pershing that if they introduced them too early, the Germans would capture a couple and uh, be able to reverse engineer them and the U.S. would lose this technological advantage that it had with the BAR. Uh, because this really was a revolutionary small arm in 1918. Now, in between the wars, between World War I and World War II, the U.S. military didn't do a whole lot to improve the gun. However, the Colt company did, as did FN. So the way this worked with John Browning was he licensed the gun to FN to produce and sell in Europe, with the exception of the United Kingdom, uh, and like Turkey and Russia, I think, were also outside of uh, FN's uh, designated market. And then Colt had the market for North and South America. So you'll find guns made by both Colt and FN in this sort of system. Well, both companies did their own development work improving the BAR after World War I. And with FN, you would see this in the versions that were adopted by the Swedes and the Poles, and the Belgians, they improved. They had things like quick change barrels and pistol grips, like this one, uh, which never appeared on US military guns, the 1918A2 that was used in World War II. Well, Colt did the same sort of development process themselves in the US, and although their improved guns were never adopted by the US military, they were sold commercially, and they were also sold to other countries. There were a lot of South American countries that ended up buying uh, Colt automatic rifles, or uh, they called them the automatic machine rifle. And Colt's improvements to the gun were actually pretty similar to what FN did, because a lot of these were kind of obvious improvements. They added a pistol grip, which we can see here. Um, they improved the forend. In some of these cases, they added a bipod, they added a heavier handguard, they added dust covers. In fact, Colt did all of these things with their Model R75, which was introduced in 1925, and that was the improved military version of the BAR from Colt. And it had, in fact, it had a, a dust cover for the magazine well, it had a dust cover for the ejection port, it had a, a bipod on it, it had a heavy front handguard on it, it had a pistol grip. These guns would be reasonably popular. They sold about 5,000 of them between the wars. However, they did also come up with a specific version in 1931 for the law enforcement market. And they called that the R80, or as it was better known, the Colt Monitor. Now, these were never all that well-known. Uh, Colt developed them, intending them for the police and security market, so they didn't really put them in their standard catalogs. They were in, their, in Colt's police advertising literature, so a lot of people never really heard about these guns. Of course, remember that this is long before the internet, so if you wanted to know what Colt was selling, you had to go find a printed flyer of Colt sales literature. Uh, and if you didn't get the police one, well, you might never know that the Colt Monitor existed. Now, what they did with this specifically was pretty much to lighten it. Um, this was intended for police because at this time, the other automatic weapon that was being used by law enforcement was basically the Thompson submachine gun. And the Thompson was found to be ineffective on a lot of vehicles during this time period. There were some cars out there with really heavy body panels that legitimately were bulletproof to pistol cartridges in some cases. Um, there were some instances with Bonnie and Clyde when they had, there were a couple of shootouts with Bonnie and Clyde in vehicles, and there you can find pictures of some where Thompson rounds are denting the vehicle and not penetrating it. So there are elements of law enforcement that want something heavier, they can really go through both sides of a vehicle. And that's what Colt was intending with the monitor here. So it's still in .30-06 caliber. And then because it wasn't intended to be a military weapon and it didn't have to be, you know, trenches of Passchendaele sort of dirt resistant, they got rid of some of the extraneous military features like the dust covers. Those are gone. The bipod, gone. They shorten the barrel. This now has an 18 inch barrel. The barrel is substantially reduced in weight. It's a much thinner barrel, especially out at the end. 
Uh, overall, this gun weighs basically 16 pounds as opposed to the 20 and a quarter pounds of the standard uh, Colt, the, the R75, the military version. They put this gigantic muzzle brake on it that's actually made by Cuts. That's a Cuts compensator. Um, and that was intended to make the gun a little more controllable. It was, of course, only meant to be fired from the shoulder since it no longer has a bipod. And this was the heavy firepower for the police. Mechanically, the monitor remains identical to a standard military or commercial BAR. So we have a three position fire selector here. F is for fire, A is for automatic, and then if we push down this little detent, maybe, there we go, we can put it all the way back to S for safe. This detent prevents you from unintentionally uh, moving the selector forward. Not exactly the world's fastest system, but there we are. It is an open bolt firing gun. So in order to fire it, you run the charging handle back, Lock it forward, it is a non-reciprocating handle, and the bolt is open until you pull the trigger. The one other control here is the magazine release. That is this button in the front of the trigger guard. Push that in, and you can pull the magazine straight out. Um, this is a straight in, locking straight, straight in, straight out magazine. It locks on this little notch here on this rear rib. Um, this is a standard BAR magazine, holds 20 rounds of 30 6 caliber ammunition. Like the World War I standard military BAR, it uses this very nice aperture sight, uh, pretty similar to what was on the P-17 Enfield rifles. And of course, the big change, both visually and for handling, is this pistol grip. That was on uh, Colt's commercial military uh, and law enforcement guns. That's one of the improvements that both Colt and FN made to this gun, was to use a pistol grip instead of a traditional stock, and it really does improve the handling of the guns. It's unfortunate that the U.S. military never adopted that improvement uh, before World War II. Now the main markings on this gun are going to be on the top of the receiver, uh, and this is the standard marking for all of Colt's interwar production guns. Um, so they call it a model of 1919. And then you'll notice that 30 there is in a different font than the rest of the stamping. That's because they roll stamped all of this marking with the exception of the serial number and the caliber. And when these guns were being sold, for example, on South American military contracts, they made them in a variety of other calibers. Um, seven millimeter Mauser was a particularly popular one. So their roll stamp covered the basics and then they would just stamp on the caliber of each particular gun when it was manufactured. So caliber 30 here in, in indicates 30 out six. Um, this uses standard BAR magazines, so it's got a 20 round capacity. And then our serial number is down here. Uh, these started at serial number 100,000, by the way. So don't, don't be fooled into thinking that Colt made 100,000 of these guns. No, they actually made, like I said, I believe it's actually exactly uh, 5,024 Colt machine rifles, or automatic machine rifles, between 1919 and 1942. Now, I know people are going to ask about this. The, the Marine Corps emblem here on the top of the receiver, this is not an original marking. This was actually added by a previous owner of the gun, uh, none other than Jim Ballou, uh, who is best known probably in these circles for writing the collector grade book about the BAR. This gun was his, and he opted to add this marking to the top of the receiver. He was very proud of uh, his service in the Marine Corps. He also added this Colt monitor mark to the left side of the receiver, which would not normally be there. A few other things we can take a look at here. This front handguard uh, looks a bit chunky. This is actually a really nice handguard to hold on to. Um, there's a, a splice in the wood here because in the R75, and a lot of these were actually R75 parts that were reused by Colt, uh, they had a magazine well cover that was hinged and it would lock, it would fit underneath the handguard when it wasn't in place on the magazine well. So this little block of wood is spliced in to fill that hole in the handguard. Then of course the most visually distinctive change, probably for the monitor itself, is this gigantic cuts compensator on the front. Um, at 16 pounds this is still, uh, this is a heavy gun but it's still fairly light for a full auto 30-06 and it was important to try and make that a little more manageable any way that was possible. The yellow has kind of escaped its bounds there, but you can see that trademark emblem from the Cuts company. Uh, they're also probably better known for making the compensators on the early Thompson guns, as well as you'll find shotguns from this period that have Cuts compensators. They were a, 
a, a popular and successful brand at the time. Ultimately, sales were pretty darn poor for Colt with this gun. Um, they only made something like 125 of the Colt monitors total, um, including you know, salesmen samples and demonstration guns. They sold the vast majority of them to the FBI. The FBI actually adopted this in 1933 as their official fighting rifle, but still didn't buy all that many of them, considering. Um, the FBI bought something like 90 of these guns. Another 20 or so were sold to other law enforcement agencies, mostly local or state police departments. The problem was just that the gun was too expensive. In the 1930s, this was selling for about $300. That's the equivalent of between $5,000 and $5,500 today. And think Depression era, there aren't a whole lot of police departments out there with the budget to go buy $5,000 machine guns in the 30s. So ultimately, a lot, of guys, a lot of police departments just decided that, you know, a 12-gauge shotgun works pretty well and is a whole heck of a lot cheaper than buying Colt automatic machine rifles. So uh, very few of them were originally made. Many, much, much smaller numbers of them exist today on the NFA registry. I think it's something like 10 or fewer are actually out there today. So a very scarce rifle and pretty cool to get to take a look at. I am excited to say that I did have a chance to actually do some shooting with this. So let's see how that went. Now the question is, what is it like to shoot the official first FBI fighting rifle? Let's find out. Got 20 rounds of genuine 30-06 goodness there. I'm actually going to start with a couple rounds semi-auto. Open pulp gun, of course. All right, I'll tell you what. Recoil from that is minor. This gun's heavy enough at 16 pounds that semi-auto 30-06, no big deal at all. However, the concussion from that cuts compensator is intense. Uh, normally, blast from a muzzle brake like that isn't really that big a deal to the shooter, but it can be uh, really an effect on bystanders. I'll tell you what, that thing is it's kind of rattling my head. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what this is like in full auto. So, full auto, let's try it. That's a bit of an experience. Wow. Um, again, the recoil is not that bad. Remarkably, I was expecting a lot more because this is like the lightweight version of the BAR. I think the pistol grip helps. This is a good hand grip to actually control the gun. Um, but man, that concussion is intense. I would, you know, I can't imagine the FBI guys who are shooting these things without ear protection in the 30s. Holy cow, man. That might explain why they only bought 90 of them is, yeah, this is gonna be a really effective gun, but man, you kind of have like a one-time use agent with it. Shooting this thing really makes you feel like a depression era lawman going after Bonnie and Clyde for real. My impressions of the BAR in general have always been a little bit tainted by the 1918 A2. 
that the U.S. took into World War II, which was very much an obsolete gun by that time, and in my opinion, it was a gun that the U.S. won World War II in spite of, not because of. It's interesting to get my hands on uh, a Colt developed version, something that, the, that Colt did, and this is pretty similar to what FN was doing at the same time, um, and see what their thoughts were on improving the gun, as opposed to what the U.S. military did. Because I'll tell you what, this is, I'm really actually legitimately surprised at how fun of a gun this is to shoot. Um, the concussion is something uh, you definitely have to get used to and accept that. But, you know what, this, is, this thing's really quite fun to shoot. I'm kind of sad that I've run out of ammunition for it for today. Um, would I actually want this if I were an FBI agent going into a gunfight? Well, today, probably not. Um, I think I can come up with something that's going to work pretty well and not scramble my brains like that cuts compensator does. But, in 1931, you know, you could have a Remington Model 8, great rifle, five rounds, Maybe you've got an extended magazine from the police supply company, but it's semi-auto. This thing is going to lay down a whole new world of firepower and intimidation on anyone that you get in a gunfight with. So I can see why it was appealing to law enforcement of the time. Uh, damn, this is a cool gun. If you're interested in having one of those 10 guns that did actually get onto the registry and is still around today, well, this one is coming up for sale here at the end of November at Julia. Uh, if you take a look at the description text below, you'll find a link to their catalog page on it. You can take a look at their picture, pictures, the provenance, the description of the gun. And if you're interested, you can place a bid uh, live at the auction or over the phone or through their website. Thanks for watching.